Good morning, everybody. And i um, delighted to be here with you today. It's a packed room on a Friday morning, so that's great. Um, thank you very much, Susanna. And um, yes, we are, uh, Susanna and I are old friends, and uh, we're just exchanging. She's coming from uh, Khartoum, and I was coming from Seoul. And I was just looking at the data in the book on urban futures, and I remember one of the pieces of work that we want to do is to understand what African cities look like and will look like in the, in the next few years. And Ricky, the last time we met, we were looking at sort of how cities and agglomerations are put together. And Seoul was one of those places where people live and work in the same place, so there is no distance traveled. And, uh, but it took me two hours to get from my hotel in Seoul to the airport. It also took me two hours to get from London uh, City to the airport. So there is still some work that needs to be done in all those places. It takes me 15 minutes to get from my house to the airport in Addis. So maybe Addis is doing something good. So thank you very much, um, um, everybody, for coming to Addis um, to discuss and have this conversation and sort of how we plan uh, urban futures. And I want to, first of all, really thank uh, Ricky and the London School of Economics, uh, the UK. Actually, we were in uh, uh, Seoul talking about inequality and with uh, Professor Bourguignon and uh, Professor Stiglitz and the issues around inequality and urban cities. So it's really, it's all coming together. And, and I think really that as we talk about inclusive growth, the SDGs leaving no one behind, we cannot do that without talking about Africa's emerging cities and Africa's youth, because that is where Africa's youth are today. They are all sort of agglomerating in our cities. And I also want to thank the Alfred uh, Herrhausen Gerschaffelt Foundation for working with us on, on this. We have been talking about our cities and what we need to do to develop urban futures for a long time. But I think that with the work that LSE is doing, there is nothing as good as being able to measure, look at the numbers, and understand what you need to change and how you need to do it better. When we talk about our cities on the continent, we almost need to start talking about them as economic entities. We talk about growth, and we talk about Ethiopia growing at 8% and being one of the fastest growing countries on the continent. We talk about South Africa not growing as fast as we would like it to grow. But when you talk about Durban, or you talk about Johannesburg, they're actually growing much faster. And so I think we do need, as a continent now, to start unpacking where is the growth. When we talk about 8% growth in Ethiopia, are we talking about all of Ethiopia, are we only talking about Addis? and Diridawa maybe. I think really as part of the new economic policies that we're putting in place as a continent, we can do better and we can do differently. We can look at you know, different elements and different entities of the growth story and ensure that as we talk about that growth story and discuss the growth story, we're making sure no one is left behind. And that is why this particular conversation today is, is, is important for us for two reasons. We believe that developing urban futures on the continent needs to go through three things. The first one is how we crowd in, and Susanna talked about it uh, extensively, financing to build the kinds of cities we want and we need. And this brings me back to, to Seoul. In 2008, when we had the financial crisis, one of the, I think, transformational policies that they took was to decide that their stimulus package would be a green stimulus package. And so they decided they would re-green all of Seoul, tear down all the roads, build greenways, and essentially what that did was it took their growth rates from about 2% to 6%, it's back now at 2.8%, which is why we're talking about inclusive growth in Korea. But it enabled them to do two things, was to rediscover and redesign the city of Seoul in a way that was greener, in a way that was more adaptable to current urban livelihoods, but also in a way that made the distances between work and living, and, and I think as Susanna was saying, much closer. And I think these are the kinds of things that we need to do today when we look at a continent that is growing only at 3.1%, which is, we are happy that Africa has sort of turned the, the curve on growth again. We were coming from 2.8, 2.9, we're now at 3.1. The IMF says we will go to 3.8 next year. That is not enough. We need to get to eight as a continent. We need to get to 10. I think when we think that we have almost 30 million kids that are going to be looking for jobs in the next few years, a lot of those jobs are going to be in the cities. I think the idea of developing urban futures presents an opportunity for us to see how we can ensure that as we redesign our cities, we redesign them in a way that creates jobs for our youth. We're gonna hear this afternoon from former Governor Fashola, who is now the Minister 
of infrastructure of Nigeria, and I'll be very keen uh, to listen to him, I hope I can, how he totally transformed Lagos. I think when you went to Lagos, you knew that if you landed, you needed to take five hours from uh, Lagos to the hotel. I don't know who's laughing. I'm sure you've done that experience. But, but now it doesn't take that long. It takes two hours, and Lagos has changed. And it could even change. I, we believe that you could do even more in Lagos. And you can do that also by creating jobs. And I think that this is really the challenge that we have on the continent today, is how we redefine our cities and do that in a way that creates jobs. We know that uh, between uh, now and 2040, we estimate that Africa will need about two a trillion US dollars in investments for its cities. Two trillion US dollars, everybody's asking, where are we going to get that from? But Again, part of the problem and part of the advantage that we have is that the cities are going to be populated by youth. The ECA just launched a whole digital agenda, which is basically looking at how we transform our ideas into knowledge and how we work on platforms. I'm, many of you who have heard me before have heard me say that Uber, that is a 10-year business, is today worth $180 billion, or so at least that is what it's predicted to be when it goes for an IPO. This is much larger than the value of GM. I was just coming from Korea and we were talking about this, GM, Toyota, and all the 50-year-old car companies in the world. So we believe that if you can design urban cities on the continent in a way where you can agglomerate those ideas and use them as platforms for new initiatives, we could actually leapfrog into the kinds of resources that we need to continue growing the economy because you will have ideas, and I think Kenya is already doing this. When you go into Kenya and you look at the iCloud factory and the agglomeration of the digital technology space with the new ideas, the new jobs that are being created because our cities are being defined differently, you see the potential. And I think that this is what we are here to do today, is really to talk about how we design and ensure that we can finance the potential for African cities to really be the new engines of growth uh, for the continent as they are already being. We have learned a lot of lessons from East Asia. I think uh, uh, I, I used to live in the Philippines and 15, 20 years ago, it's interesting because we always use the airports as the sort of example of uh, you know, how well designed the city is and how quickly it takes. I don't know the urban designers in the room will correct me or tell me why this is the case, but maybe that's because everybody uses airports. And the Philippines also dramatically redesigned its cities and became, I think, now, and, and again, following a little bit the, the Korea example or the other way around, is looking at how do you design cities in a climate-sensitive way and looking at ensuring that you have this collective human spaces where you can work. At the same time, and this is the, uh, an important point that Susanna mentioned, is the slums that gather around the cities and how you make sure and this is where the inequality uh, questions begin to become uh, uh, important. Philippines at the time had one of the largest slums in the world. I mean, disastrous, and I'm sure many of you have seen that. And so we had to design a whole program around how you do slump upgrading, slum cleaning, and actually begin to build green cities around the slums. Today, if you go to that area in the Philippines, you will not recognize it. It has totally changed, but this was using, again, the community, community resources, and social impact financing to be able to transform this part of, of uh, the city. We could do that, I think, in many of our cities. This will hold for both Addis Ababa, it will hold for Lagos, it will hold for Nairobi, it will be true for Douala uh, uh, and other countries. And so one of the things that we want to do with this partnership, and I think this is important, and we hope that you will all come with us on this journey with LSE, is to see how we can now, and when uh, I spoke with Ricky, I said, you know, so where are the African cities in your index? And there were two or three, of course, the obvious suspects. And I said, no, 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 we can't do that. If we need to start designing cities, we need to go further. We need to have at least 15 African cities on your index. So we are joining together now to get at least 15 African cities on the index. I hope that uh, many of you uh, in the room are either affiliated with some of those cities or related to them. Some of them will not be obvious because today they are still small. But if you look at our growth projections and if you look at the movements of people on the continent, in the next 15 years, those will become important cities as well. So we believe we should start looking at them today so that we can start helping in that process of design. And so a lot of the work that we will be doing in the next year, year and a half, I hope, and when we meet at the next conference, is talking about the results from uh, some of the cities that we will be working on. This is a little bit our bread and butter. We are uh, uh, here as ECA, the Economic Commission for Africa, to do some analytical work and understand and provide some contribution to policymakers as they design new cities and work uh, uh, into the future. 
As we do that, of course, then we have to talk about the energy, how you provide the right kinds of infrastructure for those cities and what is needed. We know that Africa is still struggling with its energy access. We know that we don't have, and um, I don't know if uh, Minister Fashola would say that he did a good thing, leaving from governor of uh, Lagos to minister of infrastructure of Nigeria, uh, trying to give them energy. But clearly, he's, he, he was able to begin to solve one problem in Nigeria, and he's doing a great job already at moving into increasing energy supply. And one of the things that I know that they're doing in Nigeria is looking at green and clean energy. And I think that that is another important combination of how we need to look at redesigning our cities. Is how do we do both the combination of green energy and uh, 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 clean and efficient cities at the same time? And what kinds of financing can we pull together? And we hope that we can have some ideas of how we do that and how that will be done. I know that cities like Senegal, for example, already have all their streets that are lit by uh, 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 solar energy. Maybe we need to do more on the continent and do that with our universities as well. Finally, and I see Ricky looking at his time, um, there is an important part of cities, which is the financing and how we can finance city development and how you can allow for municipal bonds to work. On the continent, we still have a lot of our countries that have access to capital markets, but our uh, municipalities do not yet have as uh, uh, frequent access to capital markets as we would like. And we know that the cities cannot develop and will never be able to provide the kinds of infrastructure that is needed if they do not have access to the capital market. So I think it's an important part of this work. South Africa, of course, Joburg, Johannesburg do already issue uh, municipal bonds, but not many of our cities do that. And I think a big part of the work that we need to do is looking at how we begin to look at as we design our fiscal policy systems and look at the cities as almost new entities and new economic entities, what are the financing frameworks? What is the decentralized framework that works to allow for uh, the cities to be able to provide for their uh, uh, residents? This brings us to the question of intergovernmental transfers. Of course, in the next 10 years, Addis Ababa will probably, that it already is, 70% of the resources come from Addis Ababa. How do you design a transfer mechanism and a transfer system that ensures that people in the rest of Ethiopia benefit from the immense wealth and the immense resources that will be coming here? And I think that the next part of this work on urban cities and urban futures, and even the United States is struggling with it today, is how does California redistribute? California is the seventh largest economy in the world. And, and, and the question then when you think about sort of redistribution of resources from California into Montana and how one does that, those are I think issues that are, are, are we, are, we are struggling with at a global level and we need to look at how we do them here. Shanghai, how do you re redistribute resources from Shanghai into inner China? And then I think that as we begin to do that and look at those kinds of interconnections, the benefit of Africa coming behind all of these other experiences is that we can learn from them and we can do much better and much faster to ensure that we get uh, uh, global growth. It was funny because uh, in London now, they have this new uh, saying of people going back to the villages. So while we have this huge momentum uh, in Africa of people moving to the cities, there is a whole sort of, I don't know what you call it, re of of, uh, of the UK and everybody's going back into the rural areas. Um, um, and, 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 and that is an interesting sort of uh, dynamic that is happening at a time when we are coming into the cities. But the question is how do we manage that in a way that balances, I think, I think what the UK is telling us is that maybe the cities don't offer everything you need and that uh, uh, we need to do uh, some balanced development which brings us uh, finally back to partnerships, is how we can work with DFID, and I was just talking with Susanna and LSE and ourselves, to ensure that this work continues, that next time when we meet, um, I'm sure Ricky's saying no, I was gonna say in another African city, uh, we can actually take this discussion uh, further ahead and see how we can provide our policymakers with the kinds of uh, resources that is needed to make sure that we actually win on this agenda and not create, I think, the kinds of tensions that we see in Latin America when cities go wrong. We have examples of Brazil as a city that goes wrong with a lot of youth in it. And I don't think that Africa wants to have a future like that. And the benefit of having these conversations early is that hopefully we don't get to um, those tensions as we move forward. So once again, um, thank you so very much. It is a huge agenda as I think, uh, 
uh, is uh, demonstrated from just what I've said, but also from all the notes and all the work that is being done. Thank everybody for coming to Ethiopia for this uh, discussion. I think we look forward to learning a lot and to see how uh, we can take this discussion uh, forward in the next few uh, days. And um, with Ricky, maybe to come back to you with what we have done for Africa as we go forward on this conversation. Once again, thank you for organizing this. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Susanna. <laughs>